in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and as always, it's great to be with all of you as we enter into the second Sunday in the Holy Season of Advent. So as always, we'd like to begin our conversation with Mary, inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the Mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church, and Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Also, when we pray to Mary, we invoke Mary, taken from the title of the Hail Holy Queen. Mary is also our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So we will invite Mary to be with us as we pray the Hail Mary, also known as the Angelic Salutation. So together, let's pray to Mary that she'll bring us closer and closer to Christ as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I'd like to invite to be with us our spiritual director. What a great blessing it is to have as our spiritual director the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has many wonderful titles. Holy Spirit is the paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of the soul. Holy Spirit is also known as the Consoler. It's also known as the Counselor. Holy Spirit is also the Sanctifier in our pursuit of holiness. Holy Spirit is our Sanctifier. And the Holy Spirit is also known as our Interior Master. St. Paul says we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so we can say Abba. Abba which means Daddy or Father. So let's uh, with great humility but also with great trust invite the Holy Spirit to come and be among us as we pray together the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. So together let's uh, pray for light as well as the, entire, uh, the interior fire of love to burn within our hearts as we pray. <clears throat> Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the lay of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. 
St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. How true it is, my friends, a family that prays together stays together. And a world at prayer is a world at peace. So, after praying with you, I'd like to encourage you by praying for you when I celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass uh, today. I'd like to pray in a special way for all of you and all of your intentions. And I'd like to offer these specific intentions on this second Sunday in the holy season of Advent. First, I'd like to pray for all of us that we would be open to the gifts and the workings of the Holy Spirit. Did our sanctification depends in large part upon us being open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps this could be our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come to the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come to the Heart of Mary. Next intention. I like to pray for our family and our family members, especially for our family members who are who have, who have walked away from God. We all have them the black sheep in our family. Pray for the conversion of our family members. Pray for Sophie's father, for Carmen's son, and all of our special intentions that God would help us with his grace and his presence and his love and his power. And then, uh, of course, I'd like to pray in a special way for, for the dying. Well, Lord says it will come like a thief in the night. And that's actually the second reading today from St. Peter. We have to be prepared. He will come like a thief in the night. We have to be prepared. And my la so my last intention will be to pray for the dying that they would obtain the grace of final conversion. Our Lord says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So, pray for the dying that they would entrust themselves to God's infinite mercy. So, 
So my friends, today we're in the second Sunday of the Advent, uh, second Sunday in Advent season. And given that we're in also year B, we have the we have the readings taken from the gospel reading is taken from Saint Mark. So I'd like to do it with you today. Let's uh, go through the gospel reading. We have Mark chapter one, verse one through eight. The, the gospel is so rich and uh, we as Catholics we have a double blessing when we pray the Our Father we say give us this day our daily bread this daily bread is the word of God Jesus says man does not live on bread alone but every word that comes forth from the mouth of God but also we're praying, we, we, we nourish ourselves on the bread of life. For that reason, the Mass, we've got two tables. The table of the Word of God, and then we have the table of the bread of life. So, as we're starting off a new year with Advent, we have the Gospel according to St. Mark. And we read, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a beautiful beginning. So we're starting off the gospel of St. Mark. There are 16 chapters. The word gospel comes from Greek, and gospel means good news. It means good news. And when the priest reads this, we say, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we mark our foreheads, our lips, and our heart. Because we want the word of God to be in our minds, in our lips, but in our hearts. And it says the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's take those words, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Best definition for Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the Son of God made man. That's worthy of memorizing. Jesus Christ is the Son of God made man. The name Jesus It means God saves. And that's the primary purpose of the incarnation, Jesus becoming man, he living among us, dying on the cross, and rising on the third day. The primary purpose of Jesus Christ is to save us. So you would often say the name Jesus with great respect such that the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, when we say the name of Jesus with respect, we're already praying. The word Christ is a Greek word, Cairo. And Christ actually means the anointed one. The kings in the Old Testament, like David, was anointed with oil. Christ is the anointed one. He is the Lord of Lords, and He's the King of Kings. The Sunday before entering into Advent was the Solemnity of Christ the King. We want Christ to reign in our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our lives. For that reason, we say, Que viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King. And then from there, we move into the prophet Isaiah. During the course 
of Advent and Lent, we read from the great prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is going to be preaching prophetically about the coming of Christ through the person of St. John the Baptist. And Isaiah says, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. This messenger will be St. John the Baptist. He'll prepare your way. That's true. John the Baptist was the precursor, was preparing the way for Christ. And given that we are Christians, or Christian Catholics, we are also called to prepare the way for the Lord in our own hearts, in our families, and in the whole world. And then Isaiah says, a voice crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. And this is exactly what John the Baptist was doing. So our paths, our path, our lives have to be leading us directly to Christ. So let's ask ourselves, if we're walking a crooked path, we're walking down the wrong path, now's the time to, to straighten out the crooked and to walk on the straight path that leads to Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Then after that, we encounter John the Baptist. So the Gospel of Mark says, John the Baptist appeared in the desert. Now let's speak briefly about the desert or the desert experience. The, de the desert experience. John the Baptist was in the desert. Jesus will be found in the desert also. Forty days at the beginning of his public life. In the desert, there is, there is silence. Silence can lead us to prayer and prayer union with God. So in the desert, we're detached from material things. We're detached from a lot of noise. But at the same time in the desert is a time of trial, where we see our Lord was tempted in the desert. It's a time of trial and preparation for our mission. So, the Baptist appears in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. a baptism of, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let me tell you a, a story that I heard a couple of days ago related to this topic, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I was in Italy from 1979 to 19. 86. That's right, from 1979 to 1986. In the year 1980, John Paul II was just a pope for even less than two years, about a year and a half. 
at about this time. John Paul II was in a, he was in a, a Roman church the Roman church and he was with thousands of children and it was getting close to Christmas and John Paul II in his dialogue with the children asked them this what are you going to give Jesus for Christmas as a Christmas present what are you going to give him and the children listened to the Pope said well preghiamo that's uh, preghiere if you know a little bit of Italian that means we're going to offer him prayers and John Paul II said that's very good But John Paul II said, I would suggest something else. Children were listening attentively, and he said, Why not offer to the Lord, the child Jesus, to make a good confession? And the Pope said, Would you be willing to make a good confession in this season of Advent? And the children said, yes, Holy Father. And he said, you really should to clean your hearts to receive the infant Jesus. Then the Pope said, lowering his voice, he said, the Pope will also go to confession. Now that story is a charming story. It's a charming story, but it really shows that all of us are sinners and need God's mercy. Only, only God is perfect. All of us are sinners. And Christ is waiting for us as the merciful Good Shepherd with his arms open in the sacrament of confession. So, as John the Baptist is preaching, baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, we as Catholics, we as Catholics have the incredible grace and privilege to receive God's infinite mercy through a sacrament, and that sacrament is the sacrament of confession. So I'd like to do just a catechetical reminder. And perhaps uh, Sophie can place these five different steps to make a good confession. This is just a catechetical reminder for us, and maybe you can review these steps with your children. Some of you even have grandchildren. So John the Baptist says, baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are forgiven by Christ through the church, through the ministry of the sacrament confession. So Sophie, this would be the first. <clears throat> first step would be examination of conscience. So our examination of conscience will be done through going through the Ten Commandments. It's a good idea to have a, a guide, a pamphlet, a booklet that explains the Ten Commandments. I think it's a good idea also not only to go through the Ten Commandments. But I think it's a good idea also to
to even write down the sins because there's always the danger of once we go to the confession that we, we get a little bit nervous and we draw a blank. So, so write them down. The second step, Sophie, would be contrition. Contrition or you might even call it contrition or sorrow for sin. Contrition or sorrow for sin. Contrition, there's two forms. There is what is called perfect contrition and imperfect contrition. Imperfect contrition is motivated by the gift of the Holy Spirit, fear of the Lord, which is good. Fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, as we read in the Old Testament is we don't want to lose. We don't want to lose our eternal salvation. We don't want to die in the state of mortal sin. We want to die in the state of grace. And perfect contrition would be also known as contrition of, contrition of love. Perfect contrition, also contrition of love. Is we don't want to sin because we know God loves us and we want to love Him in return. For that reason, Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen says, Sin is hurting the one you love. Sin is hurting the one you love. So that would be the second step contrition for sin, imperfect. Fear of the Lord, perfect love of God. Third step would be firm purpose of amendment. So firm purpose of amendment simply means this. that we are sorry for our sins, but we're going to try to avoid, we're going to try to avoid any person, place, thing, or circumstance. Any person, place, thing, or circumstance that can lead us to sin. That also entails that we would try, as the saying goes, don't play with fire. If we play with fire, we're going to get burnt. So firm purpose of amendment, I repeat. Any person, place, thing, or circumstance that could lead us into sin that we want to avoid. The fourth the fourth step would be To confess our sins to the priest. Numbered species. So confession of sins to the priest. Over the past couple of years, I have derived abundant fruit and profit by reading the diary of divine mercy in my soul with St. Faustina Kowalska. A 
I have the, the diary right here in front of me. The Diary of Divine Mercy My Soul by St. Faustina Kowalska. You can see that she's writing down She's writing down the message that Christ conveys to her. And Faustina, Jesus had her write, wrote down three important qualities of making a good confession. These three important qualities of making a good confession she said would be transparency humility and obedience or repeat transparency transparency humility and obedience. Transparency means when we confess, we should try to be as clear as possible. Confusion is a sign of the bad spirit. Transparency is a sign of the good spirit. <clears throat> Transparency, humility. My friends, it's very important that we be humble. In a humble person, especially in confession, does not try to justify or rationalize his or her sons, sins. What would be wrong is well, I'm a married woman. Father, I get really angry at my husband, but if you knew him, I repeat, Father, I lose my patience, I get angry at my husband, but if you really knew him, in a certain sense, we're kind of, uh, we're sugarcoating, we're, we're justifying we're rationalizing and our pride is getting in there. So let's be very honest in confessing our sins and not the sins of our husband or our mother-in-law, whoever it might be. So transparency is very important. And then obedience. If the priest gives us this penance, he says we should do this, we should obey. Obedience is a very important but very difficult virtue today because of wokeism, the woke society. Everyone wants to do his own thing. Our great desire our great desire is to do the will of God in imitation of Mary, Saint Joseph and the saints trying to do the will of God trying to do the will of God in every time and place So we want to uh, we want to make sure when we confess to the priest, we know that the priest in the confessional he represents Christ, the Alter Christus. I love that movie, the Gran Milagro. That when the priest is giving absolution to the woman in the movie, you see his hand is lifted up. You can see the wound in the hand of Christ, that 
it's Christ that's really forgiving. And I think we have to have enough faith to recognize that when we do go to confession, it is Christ that really forgives us. And then we, we say the act to contrition. It's a good idea for us to memorize the act of contrition. Then the priest gives us absolution. He says, And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. In that moment, your sins are forgiven. And your soul becomes as white as the snow. How beautiful. Our sins are forgiven and our soul becomes white as the snow. And it's true we should be very thankful for this great gift. And I mentioned uh, Sophie has written down for the steps. Maybe Sophie, we've got a lot of people there posting. Actually, Sophie, number five is, um, actually number five, Sophie, would be to carry out the penance. Would be to carry out the penance. So Sophie could actually write down number five is to carry out the penance that the priest gives to us. So those are the the five classical steps of making a good confession. Now just repeat those. Examination of conscience by going through the Ten Commandments. Having a booklet can be very helpful. Second would be, thank you, Sophie. The second would be sorrow for sin. An imperfect sorrow is called attrition. Fear of the Lord. We don't want to be punished by the Lord. Perfect contrition is contrition of love. Firm purpose of amendment. Firm purpose of amendment would be. We're going to try to avoid the near occasion of sin. Any person, place, thing, circumstance that can lead us into sin, we want to try to avoid. Because he who plays with fire will be burnt. He who plays with fire will get burnt. And then, finally, to carry out the penance. And I would suggest that we carry out the penance as soon as possible. As soon as possible. On Thanksgiving, we, we read through the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 17. We have Jesus who heals the ten lepers. That's right. Jesus heals the ten lepers. And one comes back to our Lord, throws himself on his face, and thanks the Lord profusely for having healed him. In the movie... Maybe some of you have seen the movie 
Molokai. Have any of you seen the movie Molokai? Maybe write that down. Molokai. Molokai was actually, and still is, it's one of the islands in Hawaii. But Molokai, my friends, Molokai, my friends, is the island where the, 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 the new saint, relatively modern saint, Father Damien Schwister, Father Damien Schwister, who became a missionary and he wanted to go there. I would suggest Mary Jo and the others, if you have not seen it, called Molokai. It's kind of difficult to pronounce. Uh, I've written it for you. Mol Molokai was one of those one of those islands uh, about a hundred years ago. Is that's where the that's where the the lepers were sent basically to die. And this was before uh, Hawaii and Alaska were annexed. They probably know that Hawaii and Alaska were the last, the 49th and 50th, 50th state annexed to the United States. But Father Father. Uh, Damien, with an N, Father Damien, wanted to go there because these people were neglected. These people were forgotten. These people were basically just rejected as, as almost the refuse of society, sad to say. Father Damien went there. And he loved the lepers. And he himself knew it would happen, that he himself died as a leper. Because he decided that he would embrace them. They said, never touch a leper, but Father Damien would always do that. And he believed, well, if God wants me to die as a leper, then I will die as a leper. But related to what we're commenting where John the Baptist says, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and we're relating this to the sacrament confession, here's the big $100 question for you. What do you think what do you think the, ba the the greatest suffering of Father Damien of Molokai was? Some of you are going to think, well, probably the heat, possibly the foul smell of the leprosy, possibly looking at people that were deformed, having lost some of their, their limbs, their members, possibly the corrupt government. There was a corrupt government there. Possibly the poor housing in Father Damien, which actually would actually build houses and churches because he was a strong farmer's son. Yes, those were sources of suffering. But Carmen has placed it. Carmen has written, not being able to confess his sins. You got it. Mary Jo put no reconciliation. You got it. And I saw this movie quite a few years ago. I have to go back and see it again. But the scene that I, I really liked most was Father Damien wanted to go to confession. And there was a boat, a ship, that was getting close to the shore. 
and on the ship was a priest, or maybe it was even the bishop. I think it was the bishop. But they couldn't disembark and get off the ship. So they stayed on the ship, and there's a charming scene. It's really a charming scene where you see Father, Father Damien Father Damien he gets in a rowboat and he's rowing as best he can to get close to that ship and on the ship you can see the crewmen among which was the I think it was the bishop Father Damien was always asking the bishop to send to send another priest because Father Damien was a religious priest like myself of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And religious live in community. He was begging the bishop to send a priest so that he would have company, community, but also to be able to go to confession. So Father Damien rose up close to the ship and the bishop is there and Father Damien he, he, he yells out his sins to the, to the bishop. Most likely some of the people on the ship were able to hear his sins. Think about that, making a public confession of your sins. How would you like to make a confession where you have the microphone and all the people in the church are hearing your sin, that would be very embarrassing, wouldn't it? Thanks be to God that we don't have to do that. Thanks be to God we don't have to do that. But it, the point I'm trying to make is that Father Damien, Father Damien now, St. Damien, he really could not live with a guilty conscience. He could not live with a guilty conscience. And honestly, my friends, I think there are a lot of people today, even among these Catholics, Many, many people today among these are Catholics. And I think that a lot of them suffer, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people suffer depression because they are living with sins, unconfessed sins. They're living with unconfessed sins, piling up sin upon sin. Here in Southern California, and many of you live in Southern California, not all of you, but some of you, many of you live in Southern California, you probably know once a week once a week, the, the garbage truck comes and he takes your plastic garbage bin and your garbage is dumped into the huge garbage truck and taken to the dump. I think all of us look forward to getting the garbage out of our houses, right? But shouldn't we make a concerted effort to get rid of the garbage that we have in our, our interior homes, our souls? That's why I really believe that many people 
many people are suffering from depression for many reasons. And I'm not going to presume to be a psychologist because I don't have that training. But I'm a spiritual physician, a priest. A priest is a spiritual physician. A priest is a spiritual physician. I think there are a lot of people, a lot of people that suffer from depression. because they're living with unconfessed sin. With unconfessed sin. How beautiful it is to be aware of Father Damien, the effort that he made to get in his little rowboat to row to the ship, to confess his sins to the bishop or priest, and to receive absolution. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What a blessing it is to be a Catholic. So I'm just commenting on one of the verses today, which is taken from the Gospel of St. Mark. And it says that John the Baptist appeared in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance, baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let's decide in this holy season, this holy season of Advent, to renounce our sins, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength to start a new life. As we celebrate the birthday of Jesus in the stable of Bethlehem, so we would like to celebrate the birthday of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in another Bethlehem. You know where the other Bethlehem is? Another Bethlehem, my friends, is in your own heart, your own soul. O little house of Bethlehem. We don't have to go far. O little house of Bethlehem. O little house of Bethlehem. Our souls is the little house of Bethlehem. So, my friends, I invite you to share our conversation with your friends. One way in which we can spread the good news is to spread, share our conversation with your friends. And I'd like to give you my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.